from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you and welcome. Um, a special note of thanks before we begin our program today to Carelis Rodriguez for um, doing all the preparation and for getting us this wonderful speaker today. I am Francisco Macias. I am from the Law Library. And on behalf of the Library of Congress Hispanic Division and the Hispanic Cultural Society, I would like to welcome you to today's presentation titled The Unlinking of Language and Identity. Puerto Rican Identity, pardon me, which is also the name of the book authored by our guest, Dr. Brenda Dominguez Rosado from the University of Puerto Rico at Bayamón. Her book melds portions of her autobiography and her doctoral studies into a wonderful introspection and examination of sociocultural linguistics and transculturation, specifically the role of language and identity. Dr. Dominguez Rosado, was born in Fairbanks, Alaska, to a Puerto Rican mother and a Mexican-American father from Texas. Go Texas. <laughs> for 32 years, she has been an educator and has been recognized for her teaching. At present, she is very active in academic life at the University of Puerto Rico. She has participated amply at various regional and international conferences among the countries where she has presented are Aruba, Cuba, Dominica, St. Kitts, Barbados, Costa Rica, Portugal, and Spain. She is also a consultant on linguistics for the Emmy-nominated travel show Isla y Vuelta. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English with a concentration in teaching English to Spanish speakers a Master of Arts in American and British Literature, and a PhD in Language and Literature of the Anglophone Caribbean, all from the University of Puerto Rico at Rio Piedras. Not only is she a scholar, she is married and accompanied today by her husband, and, is the proud <laughs> and she is the proud mother and grandmother to two sons and two grandsons. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brenda Dominguez. <laughs> Rosado, perdón. I switched on languages. Okay. <laughs> Very appropriate. Thank Pardon. you. Thank you so much. Well, um, welcome. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, although my book is focus focuses on the Puerto Rican experience, I invite you to insert your own experiences in life with language and identity. It doesn't really matter what heritage language um, you might have had experience with in your family history. Um, and ask yourself, is this happening in my own community as well? And, and please share your comments and your observations or your thoughts at the end of the presentation. It will be a whirlwind 30 minute uh, presentation. Um, I'm gonna go fairly quickly, so some of the, t the uh, slides are text heavy. Okay, so hopefully I won't go too fast. Um, it's a lot to cover. Uh, the book is based on my doctoral dissertation, and it is a streamlined version of, of it. So I have made it more user-friendly, and um, it, has, it's, it has the essence of my research. Okay? So anyway, um, let me turn on the control. All right, so I'd like to start with a really quick introduction to some of the concepts and um, terms that I use in my research and my book. Um, first of all, we must acknowledge that there is a historical link between language and identity. Okay, I think we can all agree on that. Uh, many, many studies done on that, um, but I would like to clarify that the book addresses more the identity that is our ethnic or national identity. And just to clarify what I mean by identity, it's, it's the sense of belonging to some group, what we feel uh, we are or where we belong, okay? Um, we must also agree, or we may agree, or we may know that language uh, may be a core value in cultures, okay? Culture is transmitted through language, so it is essential, okay, in, and is linked to culture as well. Um, attitudes about languages. The book has to do a lot with uh, attitudes. So 
it, we, you know, attitudes about languages are assessments made about the value of a particular language. Um, they can be either positive or negative attitudes, and that is very important because that influences the, um, the outcome of a language. A language can be born, a language can also die uh, because of attitudes. So if we have positive attitudes, that means that we uh, respect, we admire, we preserve the language, we use it. If we don't, then that means that we don't use it, that we don't preserve it, that we don't respect it, and it might die out. Um, we must also assume that attitudes are not static. Okay? They are changing constantly because of our surrounding circumstances. Um, so we must assume that they can or should change, and language policy must take that into account. Um, prevalent language attitudes provide social in, uh, indicators of changing beliefs. Okay? They're like the thermometer. They're taking the temperature. What's going on? Okay, are we, is it, is um, because we're in war, is it because we're in peace, times of peace, times of war? I mean, what's going on? Why is it changing? Um, nowadays, the need to confront and eradicate negative attitudes and stereotypes may actually be leading us away from that traditional stance of one language, one identity. Okay, so times are changing, although if we go back in history, that's what everybody said at the time that they were living as well. A lot of transformation going on. All right, so continuing, um, some of you may be familiar with Puerto Rico, some of you may not, so I'm going to try to summarize in a nutshell a little bit about the history of Puerto Rico and why we have these two languages on our island, because we have Puerto Rican Spanish and we have American English. All right, now we also have what we call the Hispanization and Americanization processes, and they have affected attitude towards both attitudes towards those languages. So. Um, Hispanization process began when the Spaniards arrived on the island in the 15th century. Um, they colonized the island. They were they they brought their own varieties of Spanish from the Canary Islands, from the Andalusian dis, uh, area of Spain, which is to the south. Um, they had different varieties. They had to reach a a, a, a common ground in language. Um, they were greeted by the indigenous population that already existed on the island, the Taíno. Um, and basically decimated the Taino population, but, you know, some did run for the hills, okay, and they did survive. Some of them did. We still have DNA of the Taino uh, in Puerto Ricans. Um, so they didn't really influence the language all that much, but we do have place names that exist today that come from their language. Um, we also had the Africans, the slaves that were brought to our island in the 16th century, and they also had their own languages. Um, they came mostly from the West Coast, the Gold Coast. Um, the Yoruba and the Igbo uh, people were the ones who were more, um, the, the ones that arrived uh, the most. Um, and so their languages also had influence on this emerging new variety of Spanish, which is known as Puerto Rican Spanish, and also the new and emerging people known as the Puerto Rican people. Okay? So we're a lovely mixture of many beautiful people and languages. And that's Puerto Rican Spanish, 400 years of Puerto Rican Spanish evolving on the island, um, creating a link to identity for the Puerto Ricans. Um, and then, that was 400 years. Then we had the Spanish-American War, where as part of the aftermath of that, Spain handed Puerto Rico over to the U.S. And that was in 1898. And so it's been about 118, 119 years since then. The U.S., um, once they arrived, uh, immediately said, Spain is out, U.S. is in. Okay? <laughs> so now you're going to speak English, and everything is going to be the way we do it. Okay? So that's how it was. So the attitudes then, where we have the positive attitude towards Spanish, because this is what we have known for 400 years, um, then uh, became a negative attitude towards English because it's being imposed. It, it wasn't a choice. It was today you speak, you, yesterday you spoke Spanish, today you're going to speak English, and schools are in English, government is in English, holidays are ours, everything is ours. And what you did before doesn't count anymore. So this is where we stand nowadays. Um, 
attitudes are changing. I just wanted you to know this because this is why this is why I felt okay. There is a change going on after a hundred years. All right, so this is where um, we stand. Now at the bottom, I have a little comment. Um, I'm. I've noticed, and many people have noticed, that there is a global tendency towards multilingualism and pluriculturalism. So, I mean, is it that we're special? I mean, is this change going on in Puerto Rico only, or is it going on in the world and we're just following a global tendency? All right, so that's one of the important questions. Okay, so the selection of my topic uh, for the dissertation slash book, because the book is, uh, is based on the dissertation, I've had my own struggles with identity related to language. Um, and very briefly, my dad was Mexican-American from Texas, um, as was explained already, my mother from Puerto Rico. My household, we were not raised speaking Spanish, even though my parents were Hispanic. Uh, they only spoke Spanish to each other when they didn't want the children to know what they were talking about. <laughs> okay, so my first language is English, um, but I look Hispanic, I think, right? And um, my, my father was in the Army. We were, uh, at a we were living on a base uh, in Texas, although at that point, when this experience happened, we were off base. So I was at a school where it was um, a public school, but off base. So everybody from other com uh, the community, not people necessarily related to the Army, were attending the school. Um, one student, I was in the seventh grade, one student approached me, and she asked me something in Spanish. And I just blankly stared at her. I had no idea what she was asking. So she thought I hadn't heard her, so she repeats the question in Spanish. And I was just, again, and she says, and then she said to me in English, don't you understand? And I said, no. And she says, what kind of a Mexican are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh my God, I was just shocked. I didn't, know, I didn't say anything. I was thinking, I had never thought of myself you know, as Mexican, as Puerto Rican, as I was just American, I was just an army brat, I was just in middle school, I, I really had no idea, but it was like a slap in the face, and I'm thinking, my goodness, what kind of Mexican am I? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I guess I'm not a Mexican. Um, but then we moved to uh, Puerto Rico when I was in the ninth grade, and um, my parents divorced. My mother returned to, um, to Puerto Rico. And I was immersed into a Spanish-speaking world. Because even though our, our languages, the official languages are English and Spanish, English is, is not used that much. In the, the official spheres, I mean, it's just the federal court, for example. We do have uh, English taught from kindergarten to the university level, but people, the majority who study, basically, in study, uh, who study in public school do not become fluent in English, unfortunately. So it's a, it's a struggle. Um, so anyway, I was immersed into the Spanish-speaking world, and then it became a question of what kind of Puerto Rican are you? You don't speak Spanish. <laughs> okay. And I was immediately labeled New Yorican. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, that New Yorican. Okay. I had never been in New York, hadn't been born there. No. So anyway, I was like, what do you mean? So I was labeled. I was discriminated against. Um, I was also called gringa. Okay, that American girl, you know, so I felt like an outsider. It was a huge incentive to learn Spanish, let me just tell you that. <laughs> I learned it very quickly, but um, I felt like an outsider, so this is part of it. And since I lived this experience myself, um, I know what it feels like. And I could, because I've been an educator for the past 32 years, and I started teaching, I'm an English professor, I started noticing these attitudes changing in my own classes when I started teaching high school in 1984. Um, the students were not that eager to learn, you know, it was like the rebellious thing, it's the, oppress the oppressor's language, you know. Um, so, but things have changed. And I said, you know what, this is a wonderful topic. I feel so personally, but it's a personal thing for me. So I think that when you're passionate about something, it's quite, it works out better. Okay, so I did a pilot study, um, and that showed interesting trends. The pilot study is documented in the book, okay? Um, research question. So, is Puerto Rican Spanish still seen as a fundamental requirement for Puerto Rican identity? Number two, if people cannot speak Puerto Rican Spanish, PRS, were not born or do not live on the island, can they call themselves Puerto Rican? Okay. What, uh, is there a changing attitude towards American English and Puerto Rican society? 
Number four, what are the attitudes towards the importance of Puerto Rican Spanish and American English as linked to identity among our younger university educated generation uh, versus the attitudes of the older generations who are university educated or not, who, who are not educated at the university level or even less than that? What are the causes of any change in attitude that may be detected? Can people identify themselves as Puerto Rican if they have native fluency in English? How much has U.S. culture influenced Puerto Rican culture? Is there harmonious integration? And number nine, there were more questions, by the way. Okay. Can Puerto Ricans take their place on the international stage by becoming proudly multilingual, yet maintaining their identity as Puerto Ricans? So, all of those questions were answered uh, and more. Now, I just wanted to very quickly go over my theoretical framework. This is dissertationese, okay, from the, from the dissertation. But I just wanted you to know that I did look at things from a historical perspective. I wanted to see if I could detect change fr uh, from different generations. So I, I wanted to start with grandparents, then parents, then the university students. Uh, to see if over this 100 year period there was a change and if I could actually document it that way. Um, and that's why I, I have focus groups. Um, functional theory, I noticed that, well, it affects people's wallets. So if you make money by knowing English, if, if job opportunities open up for you because you're bilingual, then this is something positive that is affecting the change. Then I also had the cognitive dissonance theory where when you have opposing, sorry, opposing um, attitudes that are not uh, congruent, um, you want bilingual education for your children, but you don't like the English language, okay, something has to change. Okay, so if you, then you have a, a sort of a new positive attitude towards the English. Uh, and language and identity ties that do not necessarily bind. There is a tendency now of unlinking language. It's not seen as like, oh, that's the main requirement globally. Okay, I use a questionnaire. Um, and the questionnaire had a uh, double purpose. It was for um, results. Uh, I asked the questions, people answered, but also I wanted to recruit the families. So I had very strict or requirements um, that they had to fulfill. They had to be of Puerto Rican ancestry. They had to reside on the island. They had to be literate. And they also had to be willing to cooperate with no incentive whatsoever. OK, <laughs> just a snack and some water or something, you know. Like, um, so um, and be able to uh, meet on the same day, same time. So it was. Uh, it was a, a difficult process. I also had, as I said, the focus groups that were recruited. Um, this is the methodology really quickly. I had to get authorization, obviously. Um, the questionnaire. Uh, I had to, um, this, I had problems encountered. You'll see that at the bottom, the little list. Uh, I had to go out into the hallways and find people to participate that were 21 years and older. And I work at an undergrad institution, so the majority are not older than 21. It was difficult. We were at the end of the semester because by the time I had received permission, it was already final exam time. So I was like, oh no, I was like, wandering the hallways <laughs> and stopping people and then show me your ID. <laughs> no, I'm not the police. No. <laughs> so the thing is that um, I finally was able to get enough people to, to um, answer the questionnaire to be able to recruit my families because they had to be willing to collaborate and cooperate with me. Okay, so I, the initial plan was to have 20, then I was only able to get, to, I, I said, no, 20 is too many, too many, too much, uh, 10, and then that was, that dream was slashed, and then I finally was able to get five, and then finally, at the very end, two families had difficulties, so I ended up with three families. So, anyway, but I, I was able to then have the, the focus groups. Um, and then the students were one female, two males, parents were three males, grandparents were two females and one male. I interviewed them, I gave them a choice of Spanish or English, they all chose Spanish. So um, once I finished uh, the interviews, I transcribed by myself, no machine, no helper, no assistant. Um, and this, these were hours of, of um, tapes. And um, then I had to translate from Spanish to English. Uh, and then analyze and choose, you know, what I thought were mo more appropriate qu uh, quotes and um, for the book. Okay, so it was a lot of work, in other words. Um, anyway, my salient findings, that speaking Puerto Rican Spanish is not an essential requirement for Puerto Rican identity. 
And I have some quotes that I've included. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all of them, but just so you know that um, these were some of the things that they expressed. Um, and all were in agreement. So this is from the questionnaires and from the focus groups. The link is not necessarily present because an individual's or Puerto Rican society's identity is defined by more than a language. Language is clearly important, but there are other things like culture, religion, customs that also help form a personal and social identity. So I don't consider it to be essential. Uh, there's more demographic information about all of my participants in the book, okay? But um, I was um, allowed to identify them by their initials. Number two, to be able to claim Puerto Rican identity does not require you to be born on the island or even reside on the island. And ER, the grandparents said, even if you were born American, okay, there's a, I, I don't have time to explain uh, that, but yes, there is the, if you're not, if you're from over here, then you're American, okay, and live in the U.S. If your parents are Puerto Rican, they're always going to instill in you feelings about being Puerto Rican. In other words, you have to feel it like the singer Mark Anthony, who was born and raised over there in the U.S., but who always talks about his Puerto Rican roots. I don't believe that that impedes anything. And I'd like to read this, the other quote because it, it also shows how the younger generation is, is thinking. I have family members in New York and some of my cousins have never even visited Puerto Rico, but they are proud to call themselves Puerto Rican. Um, and they don't have a complete mastery of, the, of Spanish, but they follow many of our Puerto Rican customs and defend them and are even prouder of them than we are. Okay. And American English is being seen in a more positive light. This is the grandparent. Um, he says, well, in the past, the attitude was one of complete rejection because we lacked human resources who could teach us and we preferred to speak our vernacular instead of the imported language. It is still being rejected by my generation, but to a lesser extent, because we need to use it in our daily lives because it's practically a universal language and it's necessary for everything. And then the younger generation, they, the older generations, might have associated learning English while leaving their Puerto Rican, with, with leaving their Puerto Rican identity behind, but our generation is more open and we can understand that just because we learn another language, we're not going to stop being Puerto Rican. And we, we can still feel proud of who we are. So having a university education is not a major factor in the new attitude towards English on the island. They all agreed, and they were varying levels of education. Um, number five, the use of technology has been instrumental in the change of attitude, uh, in attitude towards American English. And this includes social media and film and TV. Okay, so we are bombarded by all of the, um, the media that comes from the U.S. and in, in, in English. Um, native fluency in English or being multilingual does not appear to affect Puerto Rican identity. So uh, the parents said, even if you speak perfect English and you're Puerto Rican, it doesn't mean that you stop being Puerto Rican. That has nothing to do with it. I think we can integrate more languages and still be Puerto Rican. Number seven, a new culture with American and Puerto Rican components may be in the process of formation. This is an interesting phenomenon, and I'd love to do a you know, further study on that topic. And I'm sure that here in the diaspora as well, um, a new culture is forming. You, have, you use what's, what you have available, and you make, you know, you, you, you make it uh, your own, right? Something new. So um, at the bottom, we have the grandparents saying, yes, we have been influenced, sometimes dramatically, such as in food. Before, we didn't know what fast food was. People ate rice and beans at their local rustic restaurants in La Fonda, as we say in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, but now it's hot dog, hamburger, sushi, sirloin, and who knows what the devil else. Okay? <laughs> he was really fun to interview, let me tell you. He was great. Puerto Rican, oh, sorry. Puerto Ricans enjoy brotherly or neighborly relationships with other Caribbean nations, but they are perceived differently by them because of their relationship to the U.S. Becoming multilingual and pluricultural will not change this perception. So I'm going to read the, um, the one from the grandparent. Um, we're all neighbors, and if some people speak one language and others speak another, it doesn't mean anything. We're still neighbors. Okay? They do see us as different, very different, however, uh, because we depend on another nation, the United States. They, other Latin Americans from neighboring islands, call us the kept people of the Caribbean, los mantenidos del Caribe. 
It's a pseudonym that we've been assigned, and it's definitely affecting attitudes toward us. towards us. It's a give and take with the U.S., but we're still dependent. This is something very deep. It's something you can barely touch upon because it bothers us so much. Okay? Um, and so, on that note, the implications. The findings mentioned here are the result of a study with a limited number of participants. I do not wish to imply that the opinions of the participants represent the majority of Puerto Ricans. To do so <coughs> would be an absurd claim. However, the present study and its findings do open the door to future research into the topics analyzed. Um, the results appear to indicate that language and identity issues are changing on the island. The findings also indicate that at least some Puerto Ricans are aligning themselves both with their Caribbean and global neighbors in terms of attitudes towards language and identity. An apparent change in progress has been documented in the responses of the participants from three Puerto Rican generations reflecting a shift from a monolingual, monocultural identity to a bilingual, bicultural one and a willingness to accept multilingualism and pluriculturalism as tools needed to survive in a world that is becoming smaller and more accessible because of technology. Update. Okay, so my new 2016 study is not related uh, directly to language and identity, but it was about Puerto Rican, Spanish, and prestige. Okay, uh, I presented this, uh, this, the results last year in Spain, um, but I snuck in a question about language and identity. So um, on this online survey, I had 979 participants, um, but I only considered the ones that were complete responses, that was uh, 902. Uh, some people were non-Puerto Ricans, okay, so um, those, those were 50, 50 people, so the majority were Puerto Ricans. These are the results. Uh, if you take a look at the red bars, those are the Puerto Ricans. The tan or the beige bars are, are well, I don't know if you can see them, but um, they are the non-Puerto Ricans, and you'll see that uh, for agree and completely agree, we have 291 agree, 273 completely agree, and if we add those up, it's 564 out of 881 Puerto Ricans who corroborate my previous findings in 2010 and 2012. Um, there is a new tendency towards unlinking because of the large diaspora that doesn't speak Spanish, yet claims a Puerto Rican identity. Uh, the non-Puerto Ricans also mainly supported the idea. Okay, recommendations. A broader study needs to be completed where the apparent change in progress concerning attitudes towards the link between uh, languages and identity in Puerto Rico can be more fully documented. And I am on it, okay? <laughs> because I've already created a new survey. It's online. It's waiting for permission at my campus and at the other 10 UPR campuses. So I am expanding out to the other 10 campuses to see if they also reflect the same findings to have a larger sample. Um, and um, I'm waiting for permission, so I'm still in the process, but it's, it's going to be done. Uh, number two, more studies should be conducted in the Puerto Rican diaspora. Okay, and uh, concerning language and identity, do, my question is, do they see the link the same way as islanders do or not? Okay, uh, what is their essential requirement for establishing a Puerto Rican identity? Uh, my next major project will be to uh, visit the diaspora in cities in the U.S., uh, and in St. Croix, where there is a large um, Puerto Rican diaspora, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, in order to replicate the original study um, uh, with the questionnaire and the focus groups, although I'm thinking it will probably be the questionnaire. The focus groups is, uh, was very uphill. Okay, and conclusion. The quest for determining the link between language and identity on the island of Puerto Rico has led to thought-provoking <coughs> results. The traditional viewpoint of promoting Puerto Rican Spanish as the bearer of Puerto Rican identity and, an, and American English as the bearer of unwelcome intrusion now appears to be evolving into a modern attitude of acceptance of the idea that languages can function independently of identity. Also, the two cultures present on the island seem to be entwining and creating a syncretic new uh, variety unique to Puerto Rico. 
uh, to all appearances, it seems that a new identity is being forged, one that is not linked to any particular language, but rather includes the heart of a people and their evolving traditions, customs, and beliefs. And you may access the dissertation. It's a really long title. It's not the same. If you put my name on Brenda Dominguez Rosado, it will, the title will come up on ProQuest um, at your favorite library, probably the Library of Congress. Okay? <laughs> All right, or you can purchase my book online. It's, it's on Amazon. I was looking for it in, you know, um, this week, and it's disappeared from other stores. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, um, or you can purchase directly through Cambridge Scholars Publishing. If you have a flyer, you, there's a little code on the flyer that has a 20% discount. Okay, so excuse the self-promotion, but <laughs> just wanted you to know. Um, and now we're going to go, it's time for questions or comments. Um, I think I, um, did I, did I get the time right? I, we're good, right? Okay, yes, yes, question. I'm going to have to repeat your question because we don't have individual microphones. Yes. I thought I heard you say that um, it was mandatory to uh, learn English to read as a, uh, I'm not between the grades of uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. So I was wondering, is there any, was there any mandatory requirement for Spanish language um, okay, the question is, is that um, it's, it, well, the comment was first that the uh, English language, that I said that the English language is mandatory from kindergarten to university level, actually. And the question is, is if Spanish is also required a subject at, at schools. Yes, Spanish is our vernacular. Spanish is um, used at all times for everything except for the federal court proceedings. No, I mean, uh, Language instruction, yes, they have Spanish um, class from kindergarten all the way up to university as well. So it's truly bilingual, right? They're being taught both languages. Both languages, yes. Although English has much less uh, time devoted to it if you're in the public school system because the majority of classes are taught in Spanish. The only time they have exposure to the English, um, it, to English is in the English class. So that's about 50 minutes every day. And then, uh, but if you're in a private school, however, because this is another complete different uh, subject, um, uh, the school might be bilingual and the instruction might be in English and Spanish then is just relegated to Spanish class. Yes, question. So um, just noting on that, um, I do come from a private school um, in Puerto Rico and um, do you think it's, it's uh, important for us to maybe make a you know, study about the difference or the reception towards American English in public schools, like uh, public school students versus those private school students. Because when I went into university, I've always been categorized as, oh, she comes from a private school, so her English is very good, mm -hmm. um, versus those of public schools that do feel like there's an advantage, like they're, they're at a lesser advantage point. Um, I think the like the question that, mm -hmm. all of that <laughs> would be, how could we change that perspective in American for American towards American English in the public school system? So you want to know the the question is how students in, in, in or the, or pop the population the can population, you know, teachers and students teachers and students how can we change the attitude towards yes. English in school? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm more like your, your opinion. Right. I mean, it's the it's all in the attitude of the people who are teaching, in 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 our homes, the parents. That's where it all begins. The parents as well. Um, if you teach your children to have a negative attitude towards anything, you know, this is what they learn. So um, it has to start as a society, and you know, because even if the government mandates this uh, these languages to be learned in school, it's required, but you can't really force anybody to learn something if they don't want to learn it. Okay, so it, I think it all starts from being able to depoliticize the whole issue with language in Puerto Rico because it's very much linked to politics. Um, yes, I have a fellow author here, Frida <laughs> Parota, and she's written about this issue. And um, so it's, it's linked. We have to unlink it from politics. Uh, we have several, I mean, this is a... Uh, a 
this is something uh, for another book, but but and uh, it has been written about language and politics in Puerto Rico. But we have our political parties um, that identify the um, the pro statehood party identifies more with English and and promotes English, and then the pro Commonwealth party, the Spanish, and the indep pro independence then Spanish as well. Um, and they see it as like a, it's a power struggle. Um, it, we have to unlink language from that. Language is not, um, is, is a tool for communication, is a tool for, for many other things. It doesn't have to be linked to politics. So this is where the main problem is. And then we have the attitudes changing because we have, now that we're, we're 100 years out, you know, away from what people call the invasion um, of the U.S. forces, um, People and then our generations now with my own university students, I see their their attitudes. They're like, they don't really care. Okay, well the the U.S. came a hundred something years ago. Okay, but I wasn't even born there. I wasn't affected by it. I was born into this type of a life. Um, they see English as something that they're always being exposed to. They're much more uh, fluent, um, and sometimes they're uh, they don't even realize it. And by the way, Puerto Rican Spanish is also changing. Uh, even though we have some of my colleagues in the Spanish department hate me <laughs> saying this, but um, because they, do, you know, we we do have different register. Well, well, we have like a not. A, I want. I don't want to say a register, but we have different um, language that we use as, as everybody does. We have formal, informal, etc. Um, eh, norma culta, standard. Um, but we're actually we're seeing now the more more of the influence of the English on Spanish. And um, we see then that Spanish is also changing and incorporating, just like Taino words, just like African words, American, uh, well not American, English words um, are, are part of our language now. Yes, sorry. Would you attribute that change to the rise of the internet since the, the 90s? Yes, I didn't read the quote, but, but, but yes, technology, one of the quotes was about the social media, the internet, um, video games, uh, TV. Uh, we have uh, our fil the films arrive from the U.S. Um, in English. Um, TV shows, a cable TV, a satellite TV, all of that is in English, so definitely. Yes, Quest well, yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't actually say your question either. Sorry for the camera, the, the tape, yes. Yeah, I have a, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm not a uh, Hispanic so descendant. Uh -huh. uh, I don't have any issue with the identity, but I see this one as it has the application, I mean, has a, you know, the application actually much more than Puerto Rican, especially for people like me, immigrant from another country, mm -hmm. not necessarily Spanish. Uh, <clears throat> I see the next generation, that's what, I don't have a problem with identity, but in my children, my Mm -hmm. So that is an issue. I think that you know, highly applicable. So an issue, and what, and uh, yeah, and do you, and uh, is that uh, a comment, or would you, are you it's asking a question? Okay. It has application beyond languages. It's just identity is always there. Yes. So and you're. How do you handle that? Because it's such a big issue. Mm -hmm. Young kid coming up, I said, "What am I?" You exactly. Know, <laughs> yeah, so so just for the tape, um, his, his comment has to do with the fact that this is a global issue. This is not just Puerto Rican, that he identifies with it, that his own children have actually had the same identity crisis. It's a, it's a real here. I mean, you, you come from different places, mm -hmm. you come here, and every, you know, of course, you, sometimes you, sometime you're able to maintain your languages, mm -hmm. but sometimes you cannot. Right. But always do. Because, of course, like you said, you cannot make a kid learn the language. Mm -hmm. When you're a kid, you make them learn. They don't learn it when they grow up. I said, how come I don't I don't know it. <laughs> how come you didn't teach me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's yes, very real. I mean, it's actually, I mean, maybe, you know, it's just, uh, so as a young person, it's a real, real, real issue. Because I saw a young kid come up and said, oh, look, I really forgot my, I really forgot you know, to speak Vietnamese where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Yet my English is not good yet. So I'm really in between. Nobody, I mean, I'm between the world, which is very difficult. And it turned into some situation, they join different group of people mm -hmm. after this and after that. Yes. But anyway, that's Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, a question in the back, and then I'll come to this side. So, yes. So in, this phenomenon, oh, my wife is from Cameroon, and oh. uh, French and English were her third and fourth languages imposed on her because Cameroon was colonized mm -hmm. French and English. And now in Cameroon, there's, there's a civil war in the Anglophone provinces rebelling against 
the French imposing their French language in the schools, the courts, and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this phenomenon is worldwide. Yes. Forever. Yes. So another comment about how worldwide it is, Cameroon as well, is given as an example. Yes, thank you. And then on this side, uh, oh, I have three people. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, yes, your question, please. I'm not Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just uh, have one comment. And, uh, the, uh, when in Puerto Rico, people regard the uh, people don't speak Puerto Rican, still Puerto Rican, if you identify. But I was wondering, is there any distinction between the people who can speak Puerto Rican, Spanish, and people who don't? Because where I come from, I come from China, we have all many, many different dialects. From the area I come from, the, some people through marriage or work can stay, live there for years, but they don't speak 100% uh, accent. Then so, they claim to be from that area, then we're, we're here. Yeah, no, no. You're not. You're not. So don't, you know, yeah, they're 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 one of us. So, so, yeah. it's, so it's associated with identity. So I was wondering, in Puerto Rico, is there any that a fine distinction, whether you're pure Puerto Rican um, or you're Okay, so pure? the question is if there's any <laughs> distinction uh, when we hear people who claim to be Puerto Rican and they're Spanish and we listen to them, and if there's a distinction, and if we know immediately uh, if they are or not, is that what you're saying? Or, also or people's perception, are you not really 100% Puerto Rican? Not really 100% Puerto Rican because well you don't speak the same as we do or your accent is a bit yeah. different or off. Yeah. Okay, yes, there is discrimination. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is discrimination and as I mentioned earlier, New Yorkian is one of the labels that, although it's getting a little, I do um, write a little bit about that in the, uh, in the book, about how people are moving beyond that because they're, they have more family in the diaspora uh, then they and we actually have five million off of the island versus 3.5 and and even you know every day we have people leaving the island unfortunately um, but yes I'm um, definitely we still and we uh, but I if we flip the coin it's like when we leave the island and we're off the island and we hear somebody speaking in our own in our own Spanish we are immediate today I was thinking I know that person's from Puerto Rico okay <laughs> I could hear it and then I could, uh, but I can also distinguish that person speaks Spanish as a second language. That wasn't their first language. You know, you can, you can tell. And we also, we can tell, oh, that person speaks Spanish from the Dominican Republic, from Cuba, from Venezuela, from Mexico, from, from all. We can distinguish just like in English, just like, you know, mm -hmm. where we have all of these vi varieties. Yes, Prilla, sorry. Um, no, just a comment to echo what you, what you said about the link. That, that, that link between language and politics being kind of the operative element in this that sort of defines the whole the whole landscape and I guess how how the broader politics in a place like really sort of filter into the into into how we perceive language that just resonated so clearly with me because I mean so I um, I I grew up in I grew up in Puerto Rico of, an, of a completely international background grew up speaking English at home and went primarily to an English medium you know, to a primarily English medium private school, learned Spanish just like in life, you know, because that's, you know, because, because you know, Spanish is the lingua franca, so that's, you know. Um, and, you know, in my experience, I think I sort of felt both sides of this, both of the perspectives that you kind of, you know, every sort of stage in this transition that you lay out at some mm -hmm. point in my life, I feel like I've, I've felt it, and it has so much to do, I think, in my experience with sort of the geopolitical tensions between Puerto Rico and the U.S. You yes. know, that and and that it's those associations that filter into language that really kind of define this. Because if it was a different, because if these were two languages that were within kind of a different geopolitical dynamic, it might be completely different, as we have in so many places on Earth. For multilingualism, it's a much more it's just a different a different relationship between languages because it arose out of a different like political situation. Yeah. So politics and language very much linked. So just, yeah. And it could be any language, actually. It doesn't matter what, but because of it was imposed, yeah. that's what creates the negative attitude. Yeah. Okay. Did you have a question, or was that your, your comment? No, no, oh, yes. Really okay. the, oh, sorry, sorry. No, 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 just, no, just that, and I think just, um, yeah, kind of like reflecting on, on 
on my own research on the politics of coexistence. I think just the way the way pluralism plays out and the way people come together depends so much upon the history. Exactly. Yes, depends on history. Thank you so much no, for the comment. So yes. <laughs> yes. My yes. question is out of curiosity. The focus group at the parent level, they are only males. Pure coincidence, uh, pure volunteer. Uh, I mean, they, they were the ones who volunteered. I, I don't know, the mothers were probably too busy. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> um, and it was, um, I, I realized after, that the question was that he noticed that they were all uh, male, the parents that participated in the focus group. So it was just pure coincidence. Um, and I realized after I finished the study that I've, I had had the great grandparents available because the grandparents actually had already been born when uh, the U.S. forces uh, came in. I mean, sorry, they hadn't been born, so they were already, they had already been living with this, um, and I, I thought I might detect much different attitudes from them versus the young generation, but no, they were already like aligned with the younger generation. So that to me was really um, interesting. Of course, the great-grandparents were not available. So, um, so I had to um, document what I what I found. Any other questions? Come, yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm from Indonesia, and my ancestors are Chinese. And in Indonesia, um, because of my age, I also uh, learned Dutch. Ah. And the thing is. Um, over there, you know, at that time, when you know Dutch, it means that you are a higher level of education. Mm. And uh, so people say, oh, you know Dutch. <laughs> I think it's the same thing like in Vietnam. If you know French, you know, you are a little bit mm. elevated. Mm -hmm. So, but even now, and... I'm, I think, sixth generation in Indonesia, so I don't speak Chinese, but people still say, are you Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. So, you know, Indonesia, when, uh, Indonesia Chinese background? Say, oh, she doesn't know anything about Indonesia. She's Chinese. And there you go. <laughs> so they have, I they have identified, they have established okay, your identity. They don't let you. Me right. What you I feel you are, exactly, is, exactly. You know? She decides what her identity Every is. Every time I go to the Indonesian embassy, they sort of, oh, you speak Indonesian. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> you know, it's that type of thing, and it's it's a it's a difference of what your identity is and what people perceive of you. Exactly. Uh, so the difference between what others want you to be versus what you feel. Okay. Right. And we I mean, I know, I know Indonesian music. I used to be a dancer, Indonesian dancer. That's and fabulous, an Indonesian dancer. We want to see that, yes. <laughs> I Chinese, and I don't know any Chinese, you know. I'm s uh, and that's why I'm starting to learn Chinese, but it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> She's starting to learn Chinese, but don't let people force you into it. I mean, just because you want to, want to do so. Yes, I know that you, I, I'm trying to give other people an opportunity. Sorry, Angel, yes. I mean, sorry, Francisco, sorry, I'm yes, sorry. yes. I just I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the rise of mainstream pop culture that is sort of bicultural. Um, I think, for example, in the movie Selena. So pop there, culture. Yes, mm -hmm. There was an issue of the father was concerned about her performing in Mexico because her, her Spanish wasn't up to par. So mm -hmm. there was that preoccupation. Mm -hmm. But also with Puerto Rico, you have a lot of people who are uh, Puerto Rican-American or they're Puerto Rican, but they've made the crossover into Anglo-American culture. Mm -hmm. Ricky Martin, J. Lo. Right, Ricky uh, Martin. Um, and we, uh, there was a, a quote that Mar where Mark Anthony was mentioned, uh, right. but it's it's um, funny that you mentioned Selena because Jennifer Lopez was the one who starred in the movie about yeah. Selena or Selena. Um, 
And she's also had her issues with people discriminating, sort of saying, oh, well, your Spanish isn't that good. Mm -hmm. um, how dare you say you're Puerto Rican? Or, or if she says that she's Puerto Rican, people are like, you know, you know the eyebrow lifting or, <laughs> or whatever. But um, I believe that if she's, she's Puerto Rican, you know? She's, this is, um, it's, it's, as you were saying, it's what you think you are, you belong, that's where you believe that you belong, that you identify with. That's, uh, we even had a singer on Puerto Rico, before getting back to your question, about pop culture and, and the influence, um, where we had a singer named Tony Croato, and he was of Italian ancestry from Uruguay, and was, uh, had moved to Puerto Rico, um, started singing our, our music, um, the traditional music, and people didn't even realize he wasn't Puerto Rican. He spoke Puerto Rican Spanish. He lived on our island for many years. He married, uh, had children on the island. Uh, he died, and it was he's like a celebrated hero, you know, folk hero, okay? <laughs> and they said, if he can say he's Puerto Rican, why can't other people do that too? Okay, so it's what you feel you are. Now, pop culture has, it's the same thing because we have that huge influence of music, film, uh, social media, I mean, everything that has to do with um, the arts as well, the um, comics, um, I don't know, it's just, um, it's just an, uh, because they like it so much, our younger generations, that it, they identify with it. I'm constantly spying. Don't let anybody know. I'm, when I, walk, I walk around the hallways of the university. I'm constantly listening to their conversations and what they talk about. And, and they use a lot of English. Uh, and, but they're mixing their code switching. So we mix the English and the Spanish. And um, it's always about something they saw, the movie, or this and that, or this event, or this concert, or the singer, or, you know, so it, it has very much to do with that. And I think that um, it's also opening up their minds to um, accepting. Yes, sorry, Legna. Um, I just have a comment. I'm also Puerto Rican, but I was born and raised in the United States, but when my dad, uh, he was in the Coast Guard, so we moved around every two to three years. And when he went to the Vietnam War, he sent us to Puerto Rico for a year. And when we went there, I was in the second grade, my brother was in the first. They, the public schools wouldn't accept us because we didn't know how to write Spanish. We could mm -hmm. speak it but not write it. So there was only one school that actually accepted us, and it was a Catholic school. Then we left after a year, then went back for high school, which is where I met you. Mm -hmm. and, um, Friend from high school. Yes. yes. <laughs> and it, was, it was on a, on a base, so obviously it was all American except, you know, English. Uh, classes except for, you know, Spanish, Spanish. Or, or other history, Puerto Rico. But anyway, then I moved back. I went to school um, in the U.S., stayed here. And then now I see, fr you know, pe I talk to people here from other Latin American countries, and the first thing they say is, uh, you're Puerto Rican, aren't you? You know, just when I speak to them in Spanish, they, they hear this So accent. they identify you as Spanish. Puerto Rican, right. but, by, but the accent in what, in English or in Spanish? In Spanish. In Spanish, in Spanish yes. But then, on the other hand, I'll have I'll be speaking to somebody from Puerto Rico, and they'll say, "Oh, yeah, right." Oh, okay. So even the, she, so, the Puerto Ricans listen to her accent, saying, "Well, no, no, wait a minute." Uh -huh. <laughs> Magringa que Puerto Riqueña. So we have that judging going on, and I, you know, it's 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 hurtful, you know, when when people judge you. And if you feel you're Puerto Rican or whatever you feel, you're Indonesian, whatever. I mean, um, that's what you are. How dare people, you know, tell you, right? It's kind of it's funny. In a bus, you know, one time in a bus. They couldn't figure out where my accent is. Okay, from. so they're they're. And they asked me, "Are you from Puerto oh. Rico?" <laughs> 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 I said, "No, I'm Because of my rolling R. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. La R. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Question. Just, just Come. Said, uh, following up on her comment, um, I'm. I'm I'm, I consider myself Puerto Rican, of Puerto Rican parents, but I was born in the United States, of course, I'm a Eurekan. But it was funny, when I went to school initially in 1971-73 in Puerto Rico, of course, and it was during the politics, political year, where there was a lot, so there was a lot of tension when I spoke, where I tried to speak Spanish and the, and the thing, you know, the accent came on and everything. It was, a, it's a, it was a certain kind of take, and they're like, yeah, New Yorican. So experiencing Puerto Rico <laughs> as a, what they call a New Yorican. And mm -hmm. then I went, you know, I went to school there, took literature and everything. I thought my Spanish was pretty good. Go back in the 2000s, and my, all my cousins are there. And I met somebody, and they were talking to them, and they're like, oh, you speak Spanish really cute. 
<laughs> They're judging the Spanish. I'm thinking yes. That my Spanish is like, hey, you know, I've been, I've yeah. gone to a private school in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. Piedras, and I've done all this stuff, and I've, and I've kept up with the language. And they're like, oh, you speak cute. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So the judgment of of the of, your, the cuteness of your Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> and okay. I'm not thinking I have an accent, but according to them, yes, I do. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, and even, we don't really, we're a small island, so, I mean, we don't really have, like, major differences in language. You might have some of the vowels, depending on who the Europeans were who arrived and settled in those towns, and they, the Italian or the French that they spoke will influence the pronunciation of certain words of Puerto Rican Spanish in that area. But it's really not, I mean, we can't just say, oh, I know you're from a certain town, or, you know, no, it's not like that. I have two, I have two more questions, I think, here. Yes. Okay, so and she has so family in Puerto Rico so and from the West Indies. Any um, examinations um, in the Panamanian culture, people, um, where this whole thing of those who speak English versus Spanish, because uh, in my family, some of the older folks, are, well, most of the people in my family are bilingual, but there's, there is this tension between uh, those who are native Spanish speakers versus not native. Yes, I th- I, so it's so. A, the tension between the native speakers of Spanish and the people who are not. I think that that, is, uh, that exists in every single uh, community where you have uh, people who have left, have gone to the diaspora, have returned, returned migrants, or have stayed there. And then you ha- or uh, we have rivalry between uh, different varieties of Spanish. Okay, so where some people think that their variety is better than yours. Okay, so um, it's a lot of uh, stereotyping. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) and it does break up families. I mean, you can argue and and have division in families, etc. So I have two more. I'm sorry. Well, how much time? Just one more? Okay, well, um, should I go with Nick? I'm sorry, because I had given you a chance. I'm I'm so sorry. I said, yes. So I have interest. So he's he's half Honduran and half American, and you sp- and you and I'm just for the for yeah. the type, yes. So I speak both. Well, I went to graduate school in the UK, and then did a lot of traveling to Spain, mm. and I had the experience of being looked down upon for both of my languages. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> yes, yes. We're talking about the American Puerto Rican tension here, and the sort of the tension within North American culture and South American culture. But then when we throw in our Right. We're all kind of in the same pot of the exactly. <laughs> Being discriminated against because then the uh, people who speak British English look down upon the American English, and then we have different varieties in American English. So some people from American English look down upon other varieties of American English. I mean, and it goes it, that's, it goes round and round, the whole world, and it doesn't have to even be English. It can be any of the global languages or even dialects or or uh, the varieties that are not spoken by that many people, and then the neighbors, you know, oh no, we're better than them. Okay, so it's this rivalry, constant rivalry. Yes, and um, we have, well, we have one pending, but he, I had already um, addressed his question, so. So you okay, so. to stay afterwards to address any questions. Um, thank you so much for coming. Yes, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.